start, I can uh, introduce our esteemed panel. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Kathy Van Zale, Master of Wine. Uh, Kathy is uh, a Master of Wine since 2005. She's associate editor of uh, Platter's uh, Wine Guide, which is South Africa's uh, uh, number, one, uh, number one wine guide. Uh, lecturer, judge, and writes about wine um, before she was a master of wine for many years, but uh, uh, very uh, um, much representing South Africa uh, uh, since then for, to the world. And uh, Ken Forrester. Ken Forrester is uh, uh, known as uh, the um, uh, king of uh, Shenan. Let me just un unmute you, Ken, so uh, uh, you come back to us now. Yes, yes, you unmute, I think, yeah. And um, Ken bought a, a, a derelict farm in uh, 1993 in Stellenbosch. And um, since 1994 is making not just Chenin Blanc, but uh, a, a, a whole range of wines that are award-winning and uh, but again his belief and uh, dedication to the uh, variety is uh, earned him that uh, uh, nickname and uh, Andre Molyneux from uh, um, Molyneux Wines that uh, is with her husband Chris um, Travel the world, and she's from California, but they made wine in California, France, and South Africa before settling in 2007 in uh, Swartland and um, producing some uh, incredible Chenin, as well as some Syrah, and maybe she'll highlight a few other things that they, they are doing. So without fur further ado, Kathy, I uh, let you take it from there. And welcome everybody again. Thank you, Moshe. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all here. I recognize many, many names on the screen. So my Facebook worked and my WhatsApp worked. Thank you very much for joining us, especially Sally and Joel all the way from the USA. That's really awesome to see you there. So what we're going to be doing tonight, hopefully, is learning a little bit more about Shannon, but I think learning from two people who I respect greatly making Shannon in South Africa today. We do have a large number of really very, very good um, artists with the Shannon Blanc variety, but the two that we have with us here um, are not only um, breaking boundaries a few years ago in the case of one of them and going forward in the case of definitely both of them. So without further ado, Ken, that derelict farm, it now produces um, one of possibly the most well-known um, sub uh, Chenin Blancs around the world, the FMC. Do you mind telling us that story with all its guts and glory? And please feel free to pack it full of personal anecdotes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. You know, FMC was, was really a, a crazy, crazy project. I came out of hotel management into the restaurant industry. I ran my own restaurants in Johannesburg. And in 93, we bought a vineyard. Um, uh, I'm going to call it the midlife crisis. Age 35, decided I needed a vineyard. Bought a vineyard on a public auction at really one of the, the most um, possibly frightening times in South Africa. We were headed into our first democratic elections in 1994. And really, a lot of people were leaving the country. There was a huge amount of unrest and uncertainty. And I went and bought a vineyard on a public auction that the bank was just trying to get rid of. And the property hadn't been lived on for five or six years. The house was an absolute shambolic wreck. There wasn't a room you could live in. And the vineyards looked quite nice. And I thought we might be able to do something with this. My wife, bless her cotton socks, looked after the house and rebuilt and replanned the house while I replanned the vineyards. And we slowly started producing a little bit of Chenin Blanc. And by 94, we had a Chenin Blanc in bottle that I dared to ferment in French oak barrel. And I remember one of my colleagues looking at this saying, I can't believe it. You've got brand new French barrels. I said, yeah. And he said, and you came from Johannesburg. And I said, yeah. And he <laughs> 
if you have a, if you've got a return ticket because this can't last. This is not going to happen. And guess what? We're still here 25 years later. So fortunately, yeah, it did last. And we needed to make a difference for Chenin Blanc. We needed to make a difference with Chenin Blanc. We needed to show Chenin Blanc off that it was more than just a lowly grape ideal for producing brandy or surplus wine. That it had its own character, it had its own nature. Shy, retiring, perhaps hard to, to get to come forward and show itself. But we needed Chenin Blanc to be able to do that. And initially, using some, some oak was a good way to kind of enrich it, to show it off, to bring it up. And I was kind of very keen on doing something at a higher level. I wanted, I said to Martin Meinert, Martin was my mentor and, and very, very good friend and is to this day, which is a testimony to how much he's put up with from me. I mean, he's a great guy. And Martin, I said to Martin one day, so what are we going to do to make the best white wine in the world? And he was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> he said, like, you just got here. You've been here three years. So I said, you mean there's a statute of limitations? You ought to be here seven years, nine years. What's the number? What's the right number? When do you start making the best white wine? And he said, no, it's not like that. But maybe your kids or maybe their kids. I said, no, it doesn't have to be a generational thing. If we set out to produce something truly special, what's stopping us? And in 1997, we started making what I wanted to call the Grand Shannon. And we, we weren't quite sure of the name Grand Shannon didn't stick, didn't, didn't work, but we didn't have a better idea than that. We made this wine in 1997. We got new barrels. We got acacia heads on the barrels. We stirred the barrels. We stirred the lees. We added food for the yeast. We added, we added yeast. We added, you name it. We did everything we possibly might have thought we could have possibly done to improve the wine. And at the end of 1997, by the time we got to tasting this wine, eight or nine or 10 months later, the wine was absolutely shocking. It was awful. It was terrible. It was nothing like what we'd imagined. It <laughs> and we had to literally go back to the drawing board the following year and try again. And 98, we didn't get much smarter, I've got to say. Jointly between us, I don't know if we sat on our brains or something, but we didn't do much better. And in 1999, we got to the point where we were kind of long day in the cellar, a bit of bromance going on maybe with the sunset and the glasses full and been drinking and tasting wine all day. And we were going, yeah, this, this could be good. This will get better. So we bottled the 99 and we never sold a single bottle. The wine was awful. And finally we got to 2000 and we took the wine to the London Wine Trade Fair. At the Wine Trade Fair, Matthew Jukes came by and Matthew was tasting and very, you know, he had Jancis and all the guys around. And Matthew tasted this wine and said, my Joe, what have you got here? What's the blend? And I said, well, it's Chenin Blanc. No, no, no. He said, what have you blended into it? What have you added to it? And I said, no, it's 100% Chenin Blanc. And Matthew said, well, that might be, that is the freaking most marvelous Chenin I've ever tasted. And I said to him, Matthew, that could be a good name for the label because he's a bit stuck on the label. So we called the wine the FMC. Matthew, to this day, gets a case delivered in London every year. I get a very courteous note from him saying, that's very kind of you, thank you. Are you sure it was only one case? Which I think <laughs> is true. Yeah. It's a fantastic story, Ken. I just have to ask you one question. So, really, truthfully, what came first, Shannon or um, the farm and then Shannon? Because how old is this... Um, FMC Vineyard now, no, on the farm. Jenin, um, the, the idea was to find something we could champion. And this was the most ideal find because the vineyard was planted to about half Chenin Blanc and had Chenin Blanc dating back to 1970. And this is this FMC Vineyard. So about 50% of this pl property was planted to Chenin and the, the um, advice from the ruling kind of wine knowledge of the day was that what we should do is push out all that Shannon with the bulldozer and plant some Sauvignon Blanc because it always makes quite nice wine. And maybe some Bonito. And I was like, oh no, this can't be true. The arrogance of arriving on a new site and looking at a 20 or 30 year old vineyard and saying, 
I'm going to push you out because clearly for 30 years you've been shocking. It was really bad. I, I mean, it was crazy. How could Shannon have lasted for nearly 30 years on this site if it had been bad, if it had been poor? So my view was to leave the wine and to leave the vineyards and to find what was special about the vineyard. And the FMC showed its colors. It was a bushvine vineyard. It was the oldest vineyard on the property. It, it really just had a lot going for it and a great, great site. It's level, um, it gets afternoon sunshine, it's shielded from the wind. It really has a lot of stuff going for it. And so that FMC vineyard became the centerpiece, if you like. Now, the idea was to find a way to portray Shannon, to make Shannon, to give Shannon the kudos it deserved. Okay, now it's a, it really is a very beautiful vineyard still to this day even though it's getting to be kind of a grand dom like me. And before I ask um, Andrea about her Shen story, I forgot what I was going to ask you, Ken. It happens to me all the time. I have this wonderful question I'm going to ask, and then it goes out my head. Um, I must remember to write it down. So we're going to come back to, we're going to, come back to you once I've remembered what I wanted to ask. Cathy, uh, I, can, oh, uh, yes. I can help you there. I think it's the, <laughs> because uh, we, you, you, Ken is talking about uh, Stellenbosch, Shannon, and uh, we, we just wanted to hear briefly about the characteristic of uh, the Stellenbosch. I know it's a big area, but this is your, maybe the, the, your part, your uh, word of uh, Stellenbosch, Shannon. You know, Moshe, I think that Shannon Blanc, I, I truly believe that Shannon Blanc thrives under a condition which might seem a crazy thought, an oxymoron in a way, called cool sunshine. And if you look at the Loire Valley, they have cool in buckets and they pray for sunshine. If you look at where we are, we have sunshine in buckets and we're looking for cool. And Shannon truly thrives and produces, I believe, its best, clearest fruit expression when it has a certain amount of coolness. And I think the coolness is really a, a part of Shannon. When you go to the Loire, you get that kind of acidity and then you get that freshness, that, that absolute fruit, that pure white fruit, pears, apples, green apples. We come here in Stellenbosch, we tend to experience more of a ripeness where we're getting slightly baked apple perhaps, slightly caramelized apple, not so much pears. But I worked with the vineyard in Elgin. I was partly responsible for them planting the Shannon vineyard up in Elgin. And I worked with that fruit from when it was about four years old. And that was the most beautiful expression of cool climate Chenin Blanc, where you had literally green apples, pears. It was, and it goes back to that. As Chenin gets warmer or into a warmer zone, I think it starts to blow off some of that very, very bright fruit. And you replace that with minerality. And that minerality is equally as appealing um, in a different way, perhaps, but as appealing because Chenin Blanc, I think, of all of the white grapes, actually possesses a quality that is almost tannin like. It, it has a, a texture to it. We find that same kind of texture in Riesling, and perhaps that's not a mistake because Riesling in its past and Chenin Blanc in its past both share a relative, and there's a, a, a Vine is a grape that comes from both of the, crosses both of their paths at some point called Sabignan. And I think that possibly that might be the connection, but there is a lot of similarities in the way that Chenin Blanc ages and the way Riesling ages, in the diversity of Riesling and the diversity of Chenin Blanc. And the texture of the wine, I find a lot of likeness between those two grapes. Certainly, I don't find that same texture in Pinot Grigio. I don't find it in, in Sauvignon. I don't find it in many other white grapes. I think Chardonnay is quite unique in that. Okay. Well, I, li I like that. Um, something I've not heard before, I don't think, Ken, where you say that as it moves into slightly warmer climates, it becomes more mineral. But that's a lovely segue into where Andrea is making most of her Chenin from. And Andrea, yes, you come from California. It was interesting when I was going through the list of clones that are available in South Africa. Um, wait, I think I'm making notes on them. That clones, um, the clones 9A and 9B actually come from California. 
um, and that we do have in South Africa. But can you tell us where you made your first Shannon? How did your story begin with Shannon? It's actually interesting because, um, you know, my first proper experience with Shannon was in South Africa, but California has a nice history with Shannon as well. And until the 1990s, it was the number one white grape planted in California. Um, so much to the fact that, I mean, it was about 300,000 tons, so not, not as much as here, but still very significant. Um, and there's a sort of funny back anecdotal story to that, that in California, um, we have a very bad habit in America of naming, uh, using other um, regions protected names, for example, champagne for any sparkling wine. And um, there was a very widely produced uh, bulk, sort of off dry, not very interesting jug wine in California ironically not called Loire, but called Chablis, which was 100% Chenin Blanc. And the funny story there is, um, especially 10, 15 years ago, Americans had a very funny way of saying, I don't drink Chardonnay, but I drink Chablis. And, and it was it Chenin. Actually, but it turns out it was actually Chenin. They weren't drinking Chardonnay anyway. Anyway, it was a huge scandal um, as Chardonnay took over in California in the 90s. Um, then people started calling Shannon Chardonnay. It's all much more regulated now, and that actually is one of the things that kicked off the regulation in California, because people actually went to jail for bottling Shannon but calling it Chardonnay. So, long story short, um, there is that, that connection with California, and there's still some amazing old vines in California. Obviously, a lot of it was ripped out for um, uh, replanting specifically to Chardonnay, but there's a lot of um, ungrafted vines still all over the the state. Um, so when I went to university and we were learning about Shannon, it was an important part of the lectures. My very first internship in California, we, I worked with a very small amount of Shannon, but it was in 2004 when I came to South Africa and I was it was supposed to be a three-month internship, but I immediately fell in love the wines, the people, the climate, um, the food, the way the mountains turn pink at sunset, and specifically Chenin Blanc and its diversity and ways it can be used in South Africa from everything from sparkling wine to incredibly sweet wine, wooded, unwooded, um, warm climate, cool climate, and everything in between. So when um, when it came time to decide on where to settle in South Africa, I don't come from a winemaking family, neither did my husband. Um, and the Swartland had this amazing uh, concentration of Chenin Blanc and specifically Old Vine Chenin Blanc. Um, there's 10 times more Old Vine Chenin than any of the other Old Vine varieties in, in the Swartland. Um, and so an amazing, not just selection, but the quality of the vineyards and the people of the land here were as diverse as Shannon itself and so welcoming to new people coming in to give their interpretation of the grapes that are being grown. And there's not a lot of places in the world that can look at a, not just someone that doesn't originally come from the wine business, it's not from the Swartland, but someone from California of all places and actually welcome us with open arms to make our version of Chenin Blanc in South Africa. Okay, I'm going to take you back. Are you going to tell me where you made your first Chenin? Which was the first Chenin you ever made? So um, there was a winery in California called Sterling Vineyards, quite a large winery up in northern Napa, Calistoga area. And um, they still had a little bit of Chenin um, when I was working there like 120 years ago. Okay, and if you could then, Ken gave us a little bit of a description about what he perceives he gets from Stellenbosch um, Shannon. What are the characteristics that you see coming from Swartland Shannon? Well, one of the things I can absolutely echo uh, that Ken said is with more warmth, with more sunshine, you actually increase the minerality in Shannon, yeah. absolutely. So we, in the Swartland, the 
the primary fruit does evolve into more textural elements. So I would say in the Swartland, it's less about um, purity of fruit and it moves into spice and just immense texture, especially from the old vines. Um, you know, Shannon is very adaptable. Obviously it does incredibly well in the Loire, yet it does amazing in the Swartland. And like Ken said, if the vines have been there for 30, 40, 70 years, and they're healthy, they're productive, and they're making amazing wine, it's the right vine planted on the right soil. So it shows you how adaptable Shannon is and um, how sort of self-adjusting for climate. So in the Swartland, it's mostly grown in bush vine or goble, so creating an umbrella with dappled lighting throughout. That is, um, for us, what works the best um, as opposed to direct sunlight because we are a hot, dry climate. Um, but when it comes to the mineral edge that I personally find from Chenin Blanc, for me, it's the fact that in the winery, Chenin is also very versatile and you can make it reductively and it will be happy and you can make it oxidatively and it'll be happy. And I do find that, that oxygen and Chenin Blanc sort of enhance that minerality. And, and one thing that makes oxygen more reactive in a grape is a slightly higher pH um, as opposed to the Loire, for example. And, um, and so therefore there's this amazing redox reaction that happens with Chenin Blanc and a little bit more sunshine, a little bit more phenolics therefore coming out of the skins. And that reaction is just heightened and just really puts a magnifying glass on the minerality as well. Okay. And, um, Ken, if we can move on to, to you and just talk a little bit more about the, um, the style of, Shannon Blanc in South Africa. I was reading this afternoon um, on the very good um, Shannon website about how prior to 2010 um, we were looking at almost following the example that the Alsatians or the Australians were doing with Pinot Gris where we were trying to divide our Shannons across a spectrum of very light and or the steely and and bright and then light and fruity and then richer and more heavily oaked and that we've moved now towards the more the two styles of Shannon where it is fresh and fruity and then a slightly richer style um, because the consumers have found that easier to adapt to. Um, can you tell us or explain to us how you interpret the styles of Shannon across your range? I think, I think as, as Andrea said, you know, Shannon is um, very adaptable in the cellar and in the, in the, the terroir. And Shannon will respond, but in a kind of a bleak kind of way. I'm, I'm known to say that Shannon is cat-like as opposed to dog-like. And what I mean is when you call your cat, he may or may not look at you, but walk on and just ignore you. Whereas when you call your dogs, they come, <laughs> they come running up just in case you got a biscuit. I mean, dogs are wonderfully responsive. And Shannon is not a dog. It's a cat-like creature. Shannon will respond in its own good time. And the way in which you treat Shannon will be reflected in the response later. So oxygen is, I truly believe, a major key to Shannon. And I, in oxygen, I say whether you operate with oxygen or whether you go completely reductive, it makes a huge difference to Shannon Blanc. And Shannon Blanc, I think oxygen is the ultimate yin yang. If you can imagine that oxygen gives us life, but at the same time, every breath we take, takes us one breath closer to that final breath. And oxygen is utterly needed, I believe, in Shannon. I love the fact that Shannon can be quite oxidative through, through fermentation, that you can allow Shannon to go into old barrels. You can happily leave it in old barrels and, and not worry too much about too much sulfur providing you on your lease, that you can let oxygen work with Shannon. And it comes to almost a saturation point where it's taken on as much oxygen as it wants to, and it becomes quite stable. And utilizing that, we've kind of built a range of Shannons from our entry level Petty Shannon or something at that level, which is really very easy drinking Shannon. It's a glass of wine to have when you get home from work, 
And I joke and I say to people, it's my 100-point wine. You get home from work, you've had that kind of day, you reach into the fridge, you get yourself a bottle and a glass, you have a sip and you go, oh, nice. Well, that's 100 points right there because if it's nice, what more did you expect? That's fantastic. And if we can get that kind of appreciation out of a glass of wine, that's wonderful. I think that there's wines for those occasions where you literally need a glass of wine. You're busy cooking dinner, you're deciding what to do, deciding how long you've got to boil the spinach for, and you sit down eventually and you go, what happened to that bottle? Because it's gone. Because that's how quaffing Shannon should be. And then to take that a step further where you get to the dinner table and you actually like a wine that'll, which you could serve with your meal, I mean, Shannon Blanc, with a little bit of richness, a little bit of oak body, maybe oak to it, really lends itself to food and to a broad range of food. Whether you're doing something like um, a lightly curried mussel dish, a seafood dish, or you're doing some grilled shrimp or barbecue shrimp with some hot sauce, some peppy, peri peri or chili sauce, or whether you're doing a good old fashioned roast chicken, Shannon thrives. It loves, for example, a cheese, a double baked cheese souffle. And you to think of that kind of rich, cheesy, unctuous sauce and a nice Shannon with that, it works beautifully. So Shannon is just a great, I think it's a textural thing. And I truly believe that we perhaps don't mention texture often enough. I think texture is that critical that honestly, I believe a lot of the food that you may love or not, not love is probably more about texture than flavor. People don't like a certain food because it's squishy or slippery or slimy or, or their, their textural issues are very quite important. Be very tactile people. You know, prior to this COVID issue, we want to touch each other, shake hands, cuddle, you know, all that be very tactile. And texture, I think is important to the clothes that we wear. You might feel comfortable in a certain shirt or not. And I think texture is very important. And Shannon gives us a wonderful opportunity to experience various textures according to the way it's made. And Andrea, um, you've got your um, single vineyard Shannons, um, some of which fall under, well, most of them that fall under the um, terroir range. So you've opted to bottle according to the different soil types that the Shannon is grown on. Can you talk us through the decision to do that and what each of those Shannons bring to the table? Sure, absolutely. Um, so obviously terroir is created by many numbers of things. So obviously the, the soil, the sunshine, the people in the vineyards, um, the microbes, so many different elements create that sense of place. And, but we feel that in the Swartland, when it's the same people working in the vineyards, when the vines are the same age, um, we have a relatively um, uh, broad, um, or even I should say, amount of, of weather patterns, um, rainfall and sunshine. So we feel that the strongest fingerprint of terroir in the Swartland is the soil on which the vines are grown. So when working with the same vineyard age and the same people in the vineyard and identical um, uh, ripeness and fermentation techniques that when you taste the wines grown on the different soil types next to each other, that soil really shining through. And as I already mentioned, Shannon is incredibly adaptable to its environment around it. You know, it can be, um, you know, a beautiful um, representation of an area uh, by tasting Shannon that's grown on these different sites. And in the Swartland, well, in South Africa, we have some of the oldest viticultural soils in the world. They're, you know, instead of in Europe where uh, many of them are either volcanic or pushed off up off the ocean floor where you get um, basalt and, and limestone, in South Africa, we have very large areas because they're all ancient soils, uh, 400 million years old that have eroded away from what used to be one very giant mountain. So we can have 10 square kilometers of a single soil type, which is quite rare viticulturally around the world. So therefore we can bottle very pure expressions of those soil types. So I'll just do a quick screen share, I hope this works, of um, the different soil types. Actually, because I have one right behind me right now, this is actually some Syrah, but I can show you guys on our schist soils, you can very clearly see, I just pull it right off the wall, um, you know, the, the angular, friable structure of schist in the Swatland. And schist is a baked slate, 
um, people make roof tiles out of slate. And the whole reason is because when it rains, the water just runs away, as you can see down the slide of schist. The same thing happens in the vineyard. So it means that the roots can never get as deep and vines always want to uh, mirror what's happening below the soil, above the soil. So as I mentioned, these are mostly in bush vines. And so if you have a small rooting zone, even with old vines, they don't penetrate those stones very easily. So a small rooting zone creates a small canopy of the leaf growing area and everything is more compact then, including the bunches, the berries, and so therefore it's a higher skin to juice ratio. So when we talk about the phenolics in Shannon and the texture you get out of Shannon, when you have Shannon growing on the schist soils, it's always the most about texture and the most about um, the phenolics and not in a uh, astringent or, or puckering way that you can get phenolics or tannins in white wine, but in that enhancement of texture, but also in a refreshing way, the same way um, when you have a balance, you know, balanced food, that, that hint of bitterness that cleans your palate. Um, so even without high acidities, you can still have a very refreshing, fresh wine. Then I'm gonna do a screen share for the granite. It might take a second for you to see it. So I know there's sometimes a delay. Okay, you can see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay, so on the granite soils, although this looks like a solid piece of granite, because of the, the decomposed structure, if you drop the granite on the ground, it will shatter into billions of pieces. It, it's, it's very fragile. You would not want to make a granite countertop out of this granite. Um, so on the granite soils, because it breaks apart so easily and, and in the vineyard itself, there's a lot of these broken granules that are very sandy in the vineyard. So the roots can go two or three meters deep on these soils. So as I mentioned, the mirroring of the canopy, the leaf growing area on top, if you have very deep roots, you're gonna have a much bigger canopy. And a bigger canopy means it's cooler. It's, it's a shade, it's an umbrella. Um, so inside that growing uh, fruiting zone, it'll be slightly cooler in temperature, which means better retention of acidity. The roots will also reach their own water source. So it's, it's um, less stress throughout the year. It grows much more evenly throughout the year. And, and that's also contributing to the retention of acidity. But these very well-drained soils also create um, uh, a slightly lower amount of nutrients in the soil. So therefore the fermentations always take the longest and it enhances those flinty characters that you can get from Shannon grown on granite soils. And then one more picture, let me just get to it. Um, I can't see you guys, so just say verbally yes, if you can see the quartz. Yes, uh, no, it's still on the granite, Andrew. Still granite. Okay. Should come up any second now. Can you see it now? No, it's it's still it's still a granite. Maybe you can stop if you stop sharing and and do share screen again. It will it will give you that option. To, okay, I'll do uh, that. And uh, so let me just screen that. share then the. Now you should have it. Yes, now we see it. Wow. Okay. So the quartz soils, um, quartz is a very white reflective stone, um, obviously made of um, you know, the same material that makes silex in, in the Loire. Um, so the, the quartz stones, when you have the vine growing, even though we're in bush vine and there's shade coming to protect from the sunshine hitting directly onto the fruit and you have the dappled lighting, what a bush vine cannot protect from is reflection from the ground up. So with the quartz soils, it's reflecting sunshine back up into the canopy. And Shannon is the cutest grape in that as it gets sunshine and as it matures, it gets these little freckles on it. And at the same ripeness level, at a much earlier time in the grape's development, Shannon Blanc on quartz soils, because of that sunshine reflecting back up into the canopy, 
gets those freckles on it. It shows you that it's receiving that sunshine even from the bottom up. And on the quartz soils, before I started working with the quartz soils, specifically for the Shenan, I would have imagined that quartz, you know, it's a very pure stone and it would create this like glacial linearity through the wine. And it was actually the complete opposite. Throughout time, through, through tens of thousands of years of cultures, quartz has always been revered as a magical stone in its ability to capture sunshine and to release energy. And that's exactly what I find in the wine. When it releases that sunshine back up into the canopy and the grapes accept that sunshine, you get that, that spark and that fire from the sun on the quartz soils in the Chenin Blanc. So it becomes less about fruit and more about spice and fire coming out of that. So not high alcohol, but, but a explosion of, of, yeah, white spice is how I would describe it. So let me stop that screen share and hopefully that one's smooth. <laughs> Oh, that, that was that was fantastic. Do you see? Not that I want to take this discussion away off to another grape variety, but do you see similar expressions or similar parallels with your um, Syrah grown off those um, self same vineyards or self same terroirs? Absolutely. So that's the beautiful thing about you know when people compare wine styles from yeah. around the world, you know it's always a compliment when someone compares you to you know, a famous region that you learned about in university and now you're making wine that's being compared in that way. But it makes you realize that it's not that they're comparing the style of the wine, that there's a different element that is consistent through it. And oftentimes for me, I'll be like, oh, well, you do realize that those two wines that you're comparing are actually grown on the same soil type. So people oftentimes talk about soil types and texture. They'll talk about like sandy or loam or clay. Um, but the actual base root stone and the way the vine grows on it has, in my opinion, one of the strongest effects of the characteristics of that wine. So I personally find it across other varieties as well, but Shannon is just an amazing way to express those different soil types. Okay, thank you. Moshe, you had a question coming in, a winemaking question for Ken, actually, didn't you? Yes, yes, it's about the um, um, use of malolactic. Ken, if uh, you can highlight uh, what, what kind of uh, extent or use of um, malolactic you use in your um, channel? Yeah, Moshe, thank you. Um, I saw that question pop up and I hoped Andrea would get it. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The reality is, is that generally I want to try and preserve the acidity in the wine, and I'm not really that keen on going through marrow. I did, however, have to go through a kind of baptism by fire when I decided to do a dirty little secret, and the idea was to literally go full natural, um, no, no, no additives and, and nothing taken away, and, and no interference. So you have to go through mallow in, in old barrels or whatever you choose. But, and in, in that instance, it really did give me a, a different view of what in fact goes on. Mallow is interesting. It provides, um, I think, a great stability to the wine at the cost, at the expense of some acidity. But it, it does give the wine a different uh, breadth, a, a wider kind of feel to it a softer, richer mouthfeel, perhaps. And, uh, you know, providing you're aware that you're going to go into Mallow and you're going to pick accordingly and, and ensure that you have a suitably low pH and a high enough acidity to get through Mallow and still be in good shape at the other side, then I think Mallow has a place. But generally, I do actually try and avoid Mallow on our Shannons. We're looking for a, 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 a kind of dare I say, um, lighter, fresher, brighter style that, that, than, than Mallow would generally give. So I, I'd, I'd imagine it's also a matter of uh, different vintages uh, and you are playing to a great extent with uh, what Andrea was touching about and it's the texture. So you, can you, can you, can you tell us, because you're probably more affected by the ocean and maybe there's more 
correct me if I'm wrong, but there's more um, vintage variations? You know, we, the ocean, in fact, provides quite a, a leveling and, and balancing effect where we don't have perhaps as much vintage variation because of the ocean. The ocean's quite a constant. It's very big, very large, and it's very hard to change the temperature of the ocean, for example. So just having an ocean proximity of five kilometers away, Mallow is a massive intervention. I think that any wine that goes through Mallow does go through quite a big change. And, and, you know, you've got to understand that change before you let your wine go into it. Certainly what we would do on a, a normal matter with, with FMC, we would let the barrels ferment. It's 100% barrel fermentation. It's all wild yeast. It's all natural. There's no additives in that. We let that go through. And once we're happy with through fermentation, I'll rack those barrels all to tank, give me a chance just to get the leaves out of the barrels, rinse the barrels, and give the wine its very first dose of sulfur, take it back into barrel and put it into the cellar at about 14 degrees in the hopes of avoiding going through mallow. And we try and avoid mallow at all costs because we want to preserve that brightness. We need that, that, that acidity. We want that kind of purity. So on FMC, although some barrels will somehow get, and get buzzing and get into summer and they just start, as the cellar warms up, they will start buzzing and getting a little fermentation going, a little mallow. But 90% of the barrels don't get into mallow. Mallow is, I think, um, a step change in winemaking. I don't know. Andrea, what's your feeling on this? My view on mallow lactic is, um, well, very much what you said about stability. So in order to interfere less later, I do believe that allowing a wine to complete mallow does... Um, you know, it is, it is a, a changing of the wine, but it's a smaller change compared to what might have to happen later to, re, to stabilize the wine, depending on other factors as well, of course. But for me, what's super important about Mallow in the Swartland is, first of all, the wine wants to go through Mallow. We tend to have quite low malic acid, so there's not a huge shift. So we were able to increase stability by having not a large um, um, acid shift, but the kicking out of the potassium and the tartrate stabilization that happens after malolactic fermentation, it speeds up that process naturally, um, stabilizes the pH as well. So when, even though you're losing acidity in malolactic fermentation, it kicks off the potassium bitartrate um, reaction, um, and therefore you're also losing potassium. And potassium is so high in pH that as it falls out of the wine, it actually often lowers the pH, especially if you have high potassium wines. So for me, I don't mind having a low acid, the tartaric acid level, as long as I have a very healthy pH, because pH is the measure of active acidity. And so pH brings freshness to a wine, whereas tartaric acid brings acidity or tartness to the wine. So I always say a lemon is acidic, but a cucumber is fresh. So I often find that Swartland wines, after they've gone through mallow, might not be acidic, but they're fresh. So is a Shannon a lemon or a cucumber? I, well, in the Swartland, it's a cucumber. Okay, all right. But um, <laughs> and, the, and the lemons are good lemons. But it's just a different style. <laughs> Absolutely. Love lemons. Oh, we have another question here from um, Udo from the Netherlands. He said that, um, Ken, you made a demi-sec once. Have you done that again? Are you thinking of doing it again? Is it an interesting style for South Africa to consider? No, I, 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 far be it for me to comment on what South Africa to consider. I still trying to work out what I should consider, but from my point of view, um, because we the FMC is 100% is barrel fermented, with a range of barrels about 40% new oak, but we've got two, three, four year old barrels in the back. Um, we, we get some variation, we get some variation in fermentation, and we sometimes get a stuck fermentation. And if we can't restart that fermentation by taking out 10 liters of that juice, replacing it with 10 liters of fermenting juice, and just inoculating it with other native yeast locally, 
we can't get that barrel to ferment, I'm quite happy to lock it down and just leave it. And we'll look at it when we come to putting together the final blend and then decide how we're going to deal with that rogue little bit of sugar in that barrel. And in some instances where the barrel is in balance, where it's just so delicious that actually you don't want to blend it away. You shouldn't bother wasting it. We've put it into bottle and we bottled, I think, three Merlots to date, um, 10, 17, and 19. Um, we bottled, so we, we bottled a, a barrel at a time each time. It was just one exceptional barrel. And we're just looking at a sugar, a residual sugar. The very first one was only about 37 grams. Um, the 17, I think, was 50, I'm not sure, 54, 52. Um, and then the 19 was, again, over 50 grams. And so we, we've always looked at just taking one exceptional barrel and bottling it, um, just hand bottling it in the cellar um, without any, without any um, um, settling or fining. And so the wine's going to throw some, some tartrates in the bottle. And we've, we've never gone to release them. But, but the, the, the 2010, we did um, Nalim at High Timber in London, kind of tasted it and said, I'm buying it all. And I said, well, you can have all that I don't want. And that's fair. <laughs> I have to come for myself. <laughs> and so she did get the, the lion's share of that. She's a persuasive lady. So she yeah, but she always lion. shares it with the English rugby players. That's, that's yeah, so, the question yeah, of choice it's, when it's, the English it's, rugby players come to visit. To Udo's question, no, I don't think it's a style that we want to try and push for South Africa. I think it really is quite specialized, quite unique, and a very, very small um, interest group. I don't think there's a large interest group. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm almost tempted to say, I mean, Molo is obviously an acceptable style and it's, a, it's something that people can understand. But I'm almost tempted to, to not even call it Molo, uh, but to maybe give it another name that, that's just more explicit. Something that gives more of a description of the wine, golden nectar, or something that, that gives the wine a description that people would actually be drawn to. Because who would be drawn to Molo if you aren't actually educated in, in wines or in grapes? What, what is Molo? So if I say to you, I've got this wonderful wine, it's called Golden Nectar. Oh, that's interesting. What's that? Well, it just happens to be sweet. It's got a bit of color on it because, yes, there was some botrytis. The botrytis trapped a little bit of lacase. The lacase is an oxidative enzyme. That started to give us some golden color on this wine. The time in oak gave us some oxygen, which helped to kind of stabilize it, et cetera. So, yeah, I think it, it's, I, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's, it's a quick. Thank you, Ken. And now, Andrea, I see there's two questions up for you. Joel and Sally sitting over in the US. In California, I think, are so excited because they've got your 2010 straw wine and they want you to talk about comparatives to the dessert wines of the Loire. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it, the, you know, making sweet wines around the world is, um, it's so exciting to think that, um, you know, we say sweet wine or dessert wine. I actually try not to say dessert wine because that really insinuates only once a day. But uh, sweet wine, you can have any time. <laughs> but sweet wines from around the world are, they tend to be categorized together, but really they are their own categories. So, you know, Botrytis, Noble Late Wines from the Loire, for example. Um, so in the Loire, you know, you're dealing with the, the Noble Rot uh, Botrytis. Um, and when it's healthy and you're concentrating you know, that acidity and the sugar on the vine with the fungus. It's a beautiful thing. But in the Swartland, forget about it. I mean, we, we <laughs> look, it happens to be pouring rain right now. I don't know if you guys can hear on my corrugated ceiling, um, so, but that's rare and definitely not during the growing season. So we're very warm and dry um, during the day. There's almost always a breeze. So we have almost no botrytis in our region. So therefore, we can't make a noble late, um, but we also don't have a high enough uh, initial acidity like they would in Germany, for example, to do a late harvest wine. Um, so even though we have good acidities, it's not these immense acidities where once it gets to be, you know, 35 bricks or whatever, um, that you still have enough acidity for all that sweetness. So for us, in order to have sweetness and preserve acidity, the best style is straw wine or, or vindapai or pisito is all the same style where it's cut off the vine, dried off the vine. And that concentration process is concentrating the sugar, the flavors, 
But as I mentioned, the most important thing is the acidity as well. And that can really only be done then by doing it straw wine style, which is what we do to make a sweet Shannon in the Swartland. And that doesn't take you off the hook because you mentioned the magic word acidity. And what with the drought that the Swartland has recently been experiencing and yes, then the move to um, warming patterns all over the world, um, how are you planning to maintain your acidity in your vineyards going forward? So what is your vineyard strategy for maintaining acidity? Sorry, I'm frozen. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. Oh, sorry, no, my whole thing froze there for a second. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, I'll go just... back to that. What, I think is, what just... are your vineyard strategies for maintaining acidity in the Swatland in a global warming world we live in? Well, you definitely said the keyword of a vineyard. You know, this is healthy vineyards is the number one thing that we can do to maintain. Um, I already mentioned we have very ancient, very fragile soils. So soil health is paramount. Uh, making sure that, um, well, for us, farming organically, um, compost, you know, natural um, uh, soil foods like compost as opposed to inorganic fertilizers, because then you're maintaining microbial life as well. Um, and ultimately, it has to be the right variety planted on the right site. Um, you know, as has been mentioned a few times by Ken and myself, you know, if Shannon didn't want to grow in the Swartland, it would have been ripped out decades ago and, and replanted, but it's still here and it's still surviving. And the beautiful thing about old vines is they're more buffered against the extremes. So you still get vintage variation. You're going to still taste those varying amounts of sunshine, um, cooler vintages, warmer vintages, more intense, more cloudy. You're going to taste that all in old vine Shannon, but it does buffer. You know, it's been there before. It's, 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 um, you know, I always compare old vine Shannon to, to like having the grandpa at the dinner table and he's been through a lot before and he has very wise things to say. Um, and, that is what's going to get us through is by having healthy vineyards that can become old vines and then therefore will be more resistant to Shannon, I mean, sorry, to global changes. Um, but, the, but right now, even though we, we have had earlier harvests and we have had um, different kinds of warm spells, the one thing that hasn't changed yet is we have in our area a, a, still a very nice diurnal difference. So even though we have hot, dry days, we still have this drop in temperature at night. Um, and, and that for me is what allows, um, you know, the sunshine and the warmth during the day brings the ripeness, but the coolness, coolness in the evening allows the relaxation of the vine and therefore maintaining more freshness. Okay, super. Andrea, sorry, I, I just want to take three steps back, back because I think uh, we, sh we should have maybe touched on it maybe a little bit earlier. The differences in uh, uh, climate uh, zones between Stellenbosch that Ken highlighted and it's close to the ocean to Swartland. I, I know that a lot of the uh, uh, people here are familiar, but just uh, for those of us who are not familiar, just geography, uh, and uh, vine growing zones and and uh, climate if you can just highlight what the swartland is all about sure absolutely so we're about 80 kilometers north of the swartland more or less um and it's interesting even though the swartland is the largest um uh wine of origin in south africa um or one of them um it doesn't have the most amount of vines it's very patchy vines um, around, you know, so we're more known for our wheat, um, a lot of sheep in our area. There's three main mountains and, ah, there we go. Wow. <laughs> so the, the pink okay. area I'm is, impressed. <laughs> the pink it's, area is it's, the it's a very, I know it's a very old map because uh, you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's covering pretty much all the way to the ocean and, um, in some maps, you'll, you'll see pretty much that is the Swartland. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so it does cover all the way to the ocean. Um, however, on the west coast of South Africa, the further northwest you go, the drier it gets. So it becomes almost impossible to grow vines in large format. Um, there's a the few vines that are exactly on the coast, but not a very large amount. It's incredibly dry on the, on the Atlantic um, seaboard. But the, um, so most of the vineyards in the Swartland are actually in the interior of the Swartland. And um, between essentially where you see Picketburg, Malmesbury and Darling, if you make a triangle there, that's where yeah, predominantly yeah. the vines, especially the quality growing vines in the Swartland are. Um, so it is definitely warmer than, the Swart uh, than Stellenbosch um, during the day, but I'm pretty sure it has a cooler nighttime temperature. So we do have quite a big diurnal shift from, from day to night. Um, and it's almost eternally breezy. We are not as affected by the famous southeaster wind um, that, that can rip through vineyards in South Africa. Um, we're a little bit more protected from that. Um, but what we do have is a constant breeze and that's what allows the vines to, um, we have very little disease pressure. So we're able to um, farm without you know, a, a strong fungal influence, let's say. Um, and that definitely then makes it easier to do natural yeast fermentations in our case, as well as um, uh, just really letting us highlight that Swartland character. Okay, so um, th th that's just, just to, uh, um, to uh, highlight the uh, uh, what Swartland is uh, is is about in in diurnal uh, range and and uh, soils which you already covered. Um, it's uh, first I have to uh, to apologize. I don't know if you'll hear some noise here. It's eight o'clock here in the UK and uh, we have our uh, club for the NHS, which the fireworks. I don't know if you can hear. And, uh, oh yes, clap for the NHS. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yes, so there's a lot of noise, and in our in our neighbourhood is. Uh, is it becomes a bit of a street party now. It's a 10th and last week that we do it. So back to Kathy about uh, the, the next question. I mean, I, I just wanted to maybe um, add a little bit more um, in terms of the um, figures while we talking figures in Swatland and everything. Um, South Africa has a, just call it roughly 17,000 hectares of um, vineyard under Shannon Blanc vines and that is more than they have in the Loire. The last figures I knew I think the Loire had only 9,000 hectares so it was roughly South Africa has roughly doubled the number of hectares as they have in France um, and that represents some 32 percent of the total white wine plantings or some 18 percent of the total grape plantings in South Africa. So Shannon which we all believe was one of the first grape varieties that um, was planted by Jan van Riebeck way back in the mid 1600s um, um, and was therefore an important grape then, is still very much an important grape in South Africa. And looking at my figures that I have here for 2018, 2019 will be available soon. The Swatland has 15% of the Shannon um, vines and Stellenbosch only 8%. Interesting though for me is the, um, the split in terms of vine age because um, Ken, both you and Andrea were talking quite a lot about the contribution that the old vines made and how you refused to pluck out and throw away those old biddies when you bought that farm, the derelict farm, um, so long ago. Um, I think it's really positive in terms of the old vine footprint that of that 17,000 hectares that we have under Shannon, um, roughly 10,000, in fact, under 10,000 is 15 years and younger, but that means that closer to 8,000 is um, 16 years and older. So that's, I think that's really very exciting. And um, 
Are there any other significant differences? I know, Andrea, you talked about the depth and the texture. Ken, are there any other major differences that you can pick up between old vine Shannon and young vine Shannons? No, I think Kat, <clears throat> I think I covered it when I said, yeah, I think young vine Shannon has its place. And, and you know, young vines are really like teenagers. They're quite exuberant and they can party all night. But try and wake them up in the morning. Try and get them to last all the way through the next day. Yeah. Might not have that same capacity. And old vines are just a little more concentrated. Old vines give us that depth of concentration and often surprise you at just two years, five years, seven years later, you open up a, a bottle of, of old vine, you go, oh, it's just amazing. It's just got that staying power. It's just got that intensity that seems to last. And I don't think we get that from younger vines. I do believe that that's part of the intrinsic value of older vines. I think that that's really part of the charm of the older vineyards. And certainly there's something to older vines. At the same time, I mean, we've got to be, you know, state the obvious, that those older vines need to have been cared for and looked after and need to be in, a, in good balance. I mean, there's the, the three most important things in any vineyard are quite simply just balance, balance, and balance. And it's really what happens in the vineyard that finally determines what you're going to do with that fruit. And can we moving into um, 21 days of Shannon? Well, I'm going to make it 21 days of Shannon. I know that the Japanese are making it 21 days of Shannon leading up to Shannon Blanc Day on the 20th of June. Um, and do you want to tell us a little bit more about what the association, the Shannon Blanc Association is doing to promote Shannon? And then please do make sure because Udo, who I know imports a lot of Shannon into Holland, wants to know, question for both Ken and Andrea, how will you be celebrating hashtag drink Shannon day? South African Shannon or Loire Shannon? Well, Udo, to keep it holiday this year. <laughs> Let him just keep the Loire this year, please. Yeah, that's it. Enough said on that. Uh, quite frankly, um, we obviously will be talking about Shannon in South Africa. Um, certainly, we're also aware of the Shannon in the Loire Valley. We had a fantastic conference in the Loire Valley last year, about uh, eight months ago, in June last year, at a fantastic yeah. conference. It really was a great eye-opener, I believe, for South Africa as well as for the Loire Valley. I mean, the, the questions we were asked were really quite revealing. Um, they were surprised that we wore shoes and, and had shirts on and things like that. Oh, it was really, I mean, it was really fascinating. And the one thing that shocked me, well, not shocked me, but that I certainly had no idea of, was that I'm told, we were told there, that nearly 70% of all the Shannon Blanc in the Loire Valley gets made into sparkling wine, the Cremant de Loire, and it's consumed, of that 70%, about 90% is consumed in France. I mean, we don't see it in export markets, you don't see it around the world, and there's good reason, because it's all consumed in France. So there you have a major part of their wine going straight into sparkling. And you, you wonder what the impact of global warming will be on that. Is that going to change things? So whilst, whilst they're totally invested in Shannon, and we are to a degree, in fact, twice as invested as they are, but I, I think global warming will have a very different impact there than it will have here. I think we're already quite um, au fait to use a word, but, but, but quite familiar with working in a slightly warmer climate. And I think their, their climate change is a step change. It's a very different climate change than what we are seeing for the moment. How, how that's going to play out, we, we can all, we, who knows? But certainly, yeah, the, the Shannon Blanc Association is switched on to 21 Days of Shannon. We are promoting Shannon Blanc throughout all of um, Woza's offices throughout the world. We got our own mailing list, so we're promoting Drink Shannon. We got our button, Drink Shannon. And R Shannon is really going to be, June is going to be Shannon month. I would say to you, there should possibly be 31 days in June. Um, not, not just 30, because we're going to need that extra day for Shannon Blanc in June as well. So let's, let's get into June. And I'm sure there's going to be a huge Shannon Blanc drive from every, you're going to see Shannon Blanc coming out of your taps. You won't know how it happens. It's magic. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, who makes, is there anybody who drink, who makes Sauvignon Blanc listening? 
is I tend to drink more, more, more Shannon than um, a Sauvignon Blanc. But um, during crayfish season, nothing goes better than an ice cold Subby. I have to, I have to say. Sorry, Anna. Um, <laughs> I know I'm, ne I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> um, we will have a, we will have a crayfish and Shannon shooter. You are, you have no chance. You have no chance. My, lots of my budget goes on Shannon, I have to tell you, um, it's, it's just not fair. Now, the, the Shannon Association has done more than just um, publicise it. And um, over the years, it has definitely grown the market for Shannon or helped contribute to grow the market for Shannon. But there's a very um, a vibrant Shannon Blanc research project, ongoing project at the Stellenbosch University. I've got four pages of... Um, research that Helene and everybody has been doing and you are also um, cooperating with Evelyn and the associations in the Loire to bring a Shannon symposium to South Africa very yes. soon. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, that, that project for the University of Stellenbosch, we've been yes. working with the University of Stellenbosch for more than 10 years and we've got doctor students, we've got well, master students, We've got students, I mean, so many students have, have spent their dissertation studying Shannon, working on all aspects of Shannon, that the University of Selmos have been wonderful partners to us, really superb partners. And, and it's really been a fantastic cooperative um, measure from them. And, and we've had, we have, fortunately, um, a, a woman who eats, breathes and sleeps Shannon Blanc. I mean, Inner Smith is known to anybody who's ever had a glass of South African Shannon Blanc in their hand. And that woman is a living legend. She's a marvel. She absolutely lives for Shannon Blanc. I promise you, she, she's special. And to Inna, I drink a toast to it. To Inna. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now, um, Andrea, on Shannon Blanc Day, Loire or South African Shannon? Well, I think it's, you know, very important to think of, um, you know, the health risks we have right now. And if I have a glass of, um, South African Shannon in one hand and a glass of Loire Shannon in the other. Oh, you must I can't touch this. my face. So <laughs> I think one of each. <laughs> That's totally <laughs> true. <laughs> so there is a question to you. Do you think that the recent developments with COVID is going to affect the supply of Shannon, South African Shannon to Europe? Andrea, I've saw photographs all over Facebook today. You've got mountains of Shannon to send all over the place as soon as but that's locally, you have been exporting. No, but we have had some of the most amazing overseas support during this time, you know, the prohibition in South Africa. A lot of people all over the world have really put this extra focus on South Africa. So there's been this small golden th um, uh, explosion, a uh, silver lining um, from the prohibition, well, originally from exports, um, and therefore there was a lot of support, a lot of, um, uh, publicity, a lot of online tastings of people really supporting South Africa. So although there, there absolutely will be an effect trade customers around the world, um, you know, recession, um, looming will have an effect, but I think there, there's more attention on South Africa and South African Shenna now than ever before. So there is definitely, um, from a support point of view, some some really amazing things that have happened. Great stuff. We've had wonderful support all around the world. Okay, done. Lisa wants to know why you're not making more um, sparkling Shannon. Um, I think a lot of South African sparklings do have Shannon in them. And yes, I know it's coming. <laughs> Sparkle horse. <laughs> Hey, what if you're going to take the workhorse grape of South Africa and go from a workhorse to a sparkling wine, sparkle horse is not a big jump. I mean, it's very close. And we were in London. My wife and I were in London. We walked past a carousel on, down on the south bank of the Thames near the Tate Gallery. And then the horses were going round and the lights were twinkling. And I said to my wife, that's going to be my label. That is the first horse that every kid falls in love with. Every kid becomes an adult, and you still retain the thought of that fun horse, the, the twirling lights going around, 
And I just didn't want to be nearly almost like champagne or anything else. I wanted to be a different category. I wanted to be Sparkle Horse. And literally, we keep it on the lees for a total of 27 months. Um, the wine has a really fine mousse. It's got that wonderful, wonderful concentrated apple, green apple, Granny Smith apple kind of taste. When you take the first bite, oh, sorry, the first sip, it feels like you've just bitten into an apple. And it's still even got that tannin on your teeth that an apple gives you because we're picking it not so ripe. And necessity being the mother of invention, it's from a really old vineyard right out in front of our tasting room. And the vineyard is planted into a slight hollow. And the middle of the vineyard, we started noticing, was really struggling and not doing as well, the middle 14 rows. And after years of testing soils and testing leaf stamens and testing uh, grape bunches and just every kind of test you can imagine. Being a really fast learner, it took me about 12 years to figure out the vineyard just planted in a slight bowl and the roots are wet in the springtime. They still have winter rainfall because it's dammed up by a little roadway at the end of the fall. And so, yeah, guess what? The roots are wet. It starts late. It's going to ripen late. So we pick it early and we make sparkling wine. It's literally the same reason that champagne happened. It's kind of in that ill. But we take the fruit off the vine early. The vine no longer has the stress of ripening the fruit. We're harvesting it about 16 and a half, 17 bricks, 17 barling. So we're getting that fruit off early. The acids are right through the root. You're talking acids, literally, we talk about a dozen of acid. Yeah, yeah, it's a dozen, it's 12. I mean, you've got to be out of your mind. So it's got to go through malic. It's got to settle down. We've got to get that out of, out of kind of, fermentation and then into the bottle re-ferment and it stays in the bottle another 18 months at least and we end up with this i think it is just delicious and when i say to you that 70 percent of the chenin blanc in the loire is kept for home consumption as sparkling wine good idea it's a great way to use chenin um, it is, sorry it is it is a, a great success and uh, the uh, cremant de loire and the uh, Again, most of the world never get to taste it. And uh, you're right, it's a, it's a fantastic drink. And um, I, I take it the, um, not wishing to start a whole discussion about uh, MCC, but uh, Method Cup Classic, but uh, you have a, a, a wine that uh, I can see somebody here that uh, uh, is, a, is a fan and uh, here in the UK and um, Andrea, is there any uh, plan to make uh, sparkling in the Swartland? Um, there are people who make um, sparkling wine um, from Shannon Blanc. Uh, Krista, um, with her uh, the Chevalier uh, wines, are Swartland Shannon um, uh, done in the Cap Classique style. Um, we personally do Method Ancestral, where it's it's meant to drink. Um, younger, quicker, um, you know, a little bit more fun style of sparkling wine. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I love all sparkling wines, but because it's not our forte, I do, I do feel that, you know, you really do need to specialize in, in um, Cap Classique um, to really make it well. And um, to, for ours, to make it just more friendly, that's why we do the Method Ancestral, so for those who are watching that don't know the difference, it's just a single fermentation in the bottle, finishes that primary fermentation in the bottle, um, and then is degorged off the lees and meant to consume fresh and young. There's somebody here who's um, in the dark, and he, I know he makes a lot of um, sparkling wine. Alistair, <laughs> can't really see you, and you're muted. Um, <laughs> Is your sparkling from Shannon or um, do you use other varieties? You can talk now, Alistair. Yeah, um, we, we're using the classic varieties at the moment. We are filled with a few base wine tanks on Shannon, but we haven't quite got, oh, I don't want to call it a recipe, but quite found the balance that we're looking for in our Shannon vineyards. Um, you know, we've also got quite a high demand for our Shannon still wine shenan so we don't we haven't converted them into sparkling vineyards yet but we play around um and when we get the base wine right we'll, we'll probably try to do something it's a logical progression for us at kleine salsa 
Okay, sorry to have um, brought Hi. you into the spotlight there. <laughs> Go back. I, I, you should take that, Vivian, that I'm going to ask you a question next, maybe. <laughs> Vivian, you're sitting over in the UK. You've been drinking a lot of really wonderful wines during lockdown coming out of your cellar. Have you got any special South African um, Shannons? You did spend um, a few months here over December chasing the cricketers around the country. Um, so I know you did drink a lot of Shannon. Can you tell us a little bit more about your relationship with Shannon in the UK? Okay. Uh, sadly, I don't have any of the last century Shannon because at the moment we're only drinking 20th century wines, which is actually quite fun. Um, we had agreed to leave them to uh, our executors, but uh, we decided we we're going to drink them as co Corona could kill us all off. So uh, nothing's killing us off, but we're enjoying the wines. Um, so sadly, I don't have any old Chenin. So most of the wines we're drinking are red. In fact, uh, a red 96 um, Burgundy at the moment. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but uh, no, in fact, we did drink it. We, we drank, sorry, we drank a Loire Chenin. I think it was, um, uh, I've forgotten. I can't um, either, and I followed your posts regularly. Yeah, oh. it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I love Shannon. I love Shannon, 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 South African Shannon or Noir Shannon. You better get this right. I know. I have to get it right. Uh, no, I I really enjoy uh, South African Shannon. So my first contact with them was at Fat Ken's wines. I think FMC was the first Shannon that I really uh, really had, and then um, then we we visited um, Chris and Andrea in. Um, when you were in Ribbit Castile. Oh God, must be about oh, six, gosh, yes. six years ago, so. maybe. And yeah. uh, in fact, we were at uh, the Lou Vineyards in March last year. We took a, no, it was this year. This year? No, last year. Last year. Uh, last year, when we could still travel. And um, we took a group of uh, American winemakers um, from Virginia to South Africa and uh, they really adored your wines in uh, on that visit I mean, the gardens were fabulous at that time of year and uh, after the gardens the wines it was brilliant um, but yeah Shannon is a, is, a, is a grape that I really enjoy also the Californian ones sorry <laughs> there are Shannons from all over the place um, I think for me the best are probably the Loire and uh, and obviously South Africa. And, and as you said at the beginning, there's such a difference between Swartland and Stellenbosch. And it's fabulous to, to have that variety, which I don't think you get so much in the Loire in, in terms of variety. Yes, you get the slight regional things, you get the Savignier, you get the, um, uh, the Bonzo. Um, I think it was a Bonzo we had actually, an old one. And, uh, but no, they are, they're lovely ones, and hopefully we'll be back in December. Uh, I think Sri Lanka are playing South Africa, so we won't be following the uh, the British cricketers this time. Um, and we'll be drinking more Shinans. Thank you. Fantastic. Really well. Who else can I pick on? Unless somebody's going to ask a question, I'm going to be picking on other people here. Yeah. <laughs> I might know a girl who can get you some Shinans from the last century. Have you got yeah, any shit in the last fun. century? <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh -huh. oh, there's um, John Platter and Erica Platter up there. Erica, no scarf. Mm, can't help it. <laughs> Can we ask you which, what Shannon, are you going to be drinking Loire Shannon or South African Shannon on Shannon Blanc Day? Um, I can unmute you. We'll do it, Andrea. We'll have one in each glass. Um, <laughs> two glasses and one in each. Did Very you hear good. That? Very no. good. Kathy, sorry, I'm only drinking South Africa. Thank you very much. Yeah. Out of a whiskey <laughs> glass. <laughs> yeah, this is the new, the new wine glass. <laughs> yes. So, um, Ken, if you had to... Um, 
look into a crystal ball um, and think forward for South African Shannon for 10 years from now, what would be the thing that you'd most like to see in that crystal ball for South African Shannon? That's a hard question. Mm. That's a tough question. I think that um, whether through force or good fortune, we found Shannon to be Can I give the you some more? white land right. of yeah. South Africa. Sorry, Ken, it was really difficult, that sound. I didn't hear him. Did some, can anybody repeat? Can you repeat, please, Ken? Yeah. I think that we found Shannon to be the iconic white wine grape of South Africa, whether that's through good fortune or just force of, of volume, I'm not certain. But I mean, that, that's a debate. But I think Shannon Blanc will continue. As I said, the youngsters of today um, are all of the opinion that Shannon Blanc is South Africa's white wine. All the guys who are making wine, all the sons and daughters of my colleagues seem to think that Shannon is the stuff they should be making wine with. And they, they seem to think it's, it's theirs to use and make wine with. I mean, you know, 30 years ago, when we started making Shannon Blanc, it was a one or two horse race. There certainly wasn't a draw of 16 horses going down the field. No. And, and I think we're seeing a lot more better Shannons than we've ever seen. And I think there's, there's much nicer wine available. And I think there's different styles being experimented with. And I think there's more and more great wine happening and it's all good for Shannon. I really believe that this is something we can all look forward to. Um, I, I do think that, and particularly, you know, with global warming, looking at how Shannon performs in the Swartland, and if that's the climate that's going to be coming into the cooler regions, I have, think we have nothing to worry about. We, we're pretty fortunate. We can get more minerality. We can extract more texture from our Shannons. We work a little more, you know, with them and, and oxidatively. And yeah, I think that Shannon is going to be synonymous with South Africa, utterly synonymous. Andrea, any wishes for Shannon? If you had a, a wand from Ken's Sparkle Horse roundabout? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, I have to thank Ken for paving the way for high quality Shannon in South Africa, because like California, South Africa had a bit of a history of maybe not the best Shannons across the board. And now even entry level Shannon in South Africa just punches above its weight. And it's really winemakers like Ken keeping those vines in the ground and really pushing the category, not pushing, showing how good the category is. No pushing was necessary. The Shannon had its own momentum. And, um, and not just in South Africa, but overseas. The traction that Shannon and specifically South African Shannon has gained in the US. Um, it's a chef and sommelier's dream grape because of its versatility, because of how well it goes with food. It's been, you know, New World Shannon has been reintroduced to the US and, and I know that, that Ken has really paved the way there as well. And, and now that Shannon is becoming trendy to work with in California again, there again, it's not those those cheap and nasty Shannons that were being made in the past. A lot of them are still the same vines, but now making just world-class Shannons. Um, so yeah, I think it's just so exciting to see this upward trajectory of Shannon Blanc internationally. You know, just, uh, just to cover uh, new, re new regions, uh, Andrea and Ken, uh, are you uh, uh, tempted to uh, move into uh, New um, areas, Olifant River, maybe Tulbach, Andrea. <laughs> to be honest, I, I mean, I have made a little bit of modern day Shannon in California, um, just keeping a foot there, but not wanting to replicate what I do here. So just a different approach on it, but still old vines, ungrafted vines from the Sierra foothills. Um, so I do love experimenting with Shannon. I don't have any current plans in South Africa to make it in other places just because of, you know, we're still um, educating about the Swartland and about the soils and about what varieties work well here. So, um, but there's no 
short-term gratification and winemaking. Everything we do is for the next generation, for our children, for their children. So maybe one day our children or our grandchildren will think, will think that what we've done has been amazing and they'll move on to the next thing, or they might think we were absolutely nuts. We'll see, only time will tell. Excellent. Uh, closing words with, by anybody can? Kathy, please. Can I have one more question, please? Sorry. Of course. Of course. Just one. Sorry, Ken. Sorry, Andrea. I know you both had very, very busy, busy days. Um, firstly, Yvonne, if you want to send me an email address, I'll take up that conversation with you about clones on email, if that's okay. But um, Andrea, um, Shannon, single variety or blend? Ken, Shannon, single variety or blend? Andrea, well, I'll go know. first. <laughs> Okay, for me, both. <laughs> I mean, I, I love it as a single variety and for its ability to be a chameleon of terroir. But in South Africa, I don't know about everywhere, but in South Africa, it works amazing as a blending component. The way it stands as the strong cornerstone of a blend, yet embraces other varieties with it to really um, create a South African textural balanced character and and Shannon is is the glue that binds it together I'm so in agreement with everything that Andrea says so in agreement I think that that's just right your Shannon is your Shannon blends Shannon lends so much I've got to say though that sadly the market is the great decider the great arbiter and selling white wine blends Honestly, with respect, and I don't mean to cite anybody, like selling Siberia. Everybody knows where it is and nobody really wants to go. You know, selling white wine blends is very difficult in any kind of volume at all. You can sell something special in a small batch, but to sell a white wine blend, talk to, talk to the, the buyers um, who, who sell ranges of wine on supermarket shelves. They really do struggle with blends. To get a blend to work somehow seems just, I don't know, beyond the grasp of, of, our, of our buyers. It's just very, very hard to make that happen. I would love to see it happen. Um, I've made a few Shannon blends and I think, I, I just love Shannon when it's blended. It lends texture, as Andrea says. It is the glue that binds. You can put Shannon together with Grenache Blanc, with Roussan, with Marsan. You can put Shannon into just about anything and it adds that wonderful textural glue that pulls it all together. But then what do you do when you've got 30,000 liters of that wine, the 40,000 bottles, who's going to help you drink it? I can do my bit, but I need some help. I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I think that brings it uh, to a close and we're pretty much on the minute. So, uh, Thank you everybody for your questions and your interest and in supporting South Africa uh, and South African wine. Uh, I was tempted to ask about the situation at the moment, but uh, I think uh, even you, Kathy, we were conversing, we were talking all week and uh, you couldn't tell me what, exactly what's going on in, in the country as far as uh, lockdown and alcohol sales is concerned. So. Maybe we won't delve into it now, but... Uh, Monday we're shopping, eh? <laughs> oh, okay. You did say yesterday that there might be a U-turn, but... Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Slip-flop, flip-flop. So, Monday okay. I'm shopping. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good news for the wine industry. We've had some very clear messages today, some very good news. And that news has extended surprisingly to anybody with a liquor license, be that an on-trade, or off trade, off on consumption or off consumption license is entitled to sell wine from eight to five, Monday to Thursday. There's no wine sales on weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or public holidays. But as from tomorrow, Friday the 29th, we are entitled to deliver wine to our customers. So we've already been freed up on delivery. The crazy thing was that we would be opened up for, for wine sales on June the 1st. Well, that's fine, but except none of our customers have wine in stock. So now they've, they've thought about that, they've worked it out, 
They've allowed us from tomorrow, Friday, one day, to deliver wine into our customers' warehouses so that we're beginning to get wine into shelves. We're beginning to get wine into distribution centers. So yes, we're starting to see some very good news. Obviously, um, I can't help just mentioning that with all of this opening up the economy, which is so very, very vital, we are gonna have to really enforce all of the protocols required to keep everybody safe. Because right now, this is when the virus truly begins to be transmitted. So we really need to be very, very careful in terms of our staff, in terms of the people we're dealing with to ensure safety for everybody. Absolutely. I, um, yeah, so I, I want to encourage everybody to take on the um, 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 Shenan days that are coming and the uh, 20th of June, right, is the, the actual right. day. And uh, thank you again, everybody. Fascinating discussion. And um, when the skies are open again, we, we all have to visit because now it's, uh, <laughs> we, we have new regions to visit. Thank you, everybody, and have a good uh, weekend ahead. Thank you, Moshe. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.